I, um, I'd love it if just really briefly, and we are going to be brief in, in this, we, we turn to John's Gospel in chapter 12. Because um, I am of the opinion that um, that we have one job, and that is to seek the presence of God. That if there is a hermeneutic in, in the Bible, it is the presence hermeneutic. Um, that God wants to fill this earth with his presence. And, uh, you know, he, he, when Jesus gets mad in the temple, I've, I've always thought it was because of um, the way in which his house is being used, and it, and, it, and it probably is. But I think the reason he's getting mad in the temple is because everything is about the presence of God. You know, the, the presence of God is supposed to fill this earth, but but when uh, you and I were created first, Adam in, and Eve in the garden, the the Spirit of God walked with God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden, and there were there was there was nothing between God and man in that moment. And of course, sin entered the world, and there was a division between us and God. And uh, and then God continues to uh, pursue presence with people by by being with a nation, chooses Israel, and then of course Israel sins and Israel, and then what what happens is that the the presence of God becomes restricted to one person for one day of the year in one place, the Holy of Holies in the temple. You know the story, and so when Jesus walks into the temple courts. Why is he so mad? I think he's mad because this should not be. The presence of God is supposed to be with the people of God. And so he walks through the court of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are excluded from the presence of God, and he's mad. He walks through the court of women, and the women are excluded from the presence of God, and he's mad. He walks through the court of men, and he realizes that most men are excluded from the presence of God, and, and, and he's and he's mad. Um, he's, and he takes a whip out and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The, um, the presence of God is represented in the Holy of Holies by a flame that is kept alight. That's the job of the priests, to keep the flame alight. Which means that it's very interesting that when Jesus dies on a cross and the curtain is torn in two from top to bottom and then rises from the dead. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God comes. The resemblance of the presence of God is a flame on the top of every believer because, of course, the presence is now out and the Spirit of God resides not in a place but in human hearts. And the story of the rest of the Acts of the Apostles is the story of the spread of the presence of God until one day the presence of God will fill the earth as the waters fill the sea. That's that's the culmination of the kingdom of God. And so it is the presence of God that is the thing that we're supposed to seek. It's the thing that we're supposed to covet. And it's the, it, it's the very thing that we carry into this world. We have one job. Stop trying to live for Jesus. He doesn't need you to. Start living with Jesus and you'll live like Jesus. Does that make sense? So the reality is the pre- it's the presence of God in you that so fills you, that comes out of you, that is the life of God all around you, that is the mission of God in this world. So we have one job. I love this story. This story will ruin you if you if if you if you really imbibe it. It's the story of Mary at Bethany. This is a story for you activists. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. I love the incidental nature of of the the narrative, don't you? Just came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, of course. <laughs> That's what Martha does. 
And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. There was a moment a few weeks ago when he was reclining in another way. (laughs) That's not in the Bible, I just made that bit up. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard in other and the other you know this this is this is recorded in every other gospel uh in another gospel it says a hundred percent pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples. He who was about to betray him said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? There's always someone like this in the church, isn't there? He said this not because he cared about the poor, I love this, but because he was a thief. (laughs) And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Like there is there is a hugely long sermon in this. Um, but let me just make a few a few comments. This is Mary of Bethany in other versions. Would do, are, are there two Marys? I don't think so. There are other versions of this of this story because there are other filters, there are other lenses. Uh, we're not exactly sure who she is. Um, but we we do know that she has a jar of nard oil, um, which is like the craziest and most expensive of all the perfumes. It's found in the hills of the Himalayas, and you can still get it today. And we do know that this perfume was worth about a year's wages. Why has she got this perfume? We're not sure. We could speculate. It, 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 it might be her dowry. That was a possibility. It possibly is all that she has. It's possibly everything that she has to offer to anyone who might have her. And she smashes her jar and anoints the feet and the hair of Jesus. And Judas is offended. And it's easy to to slag off Judas because he's Judas. But if John was offended, we might agree with him. Because it is a year's wages. And we're supposed to be stewards of this stuff God has given to us. And we have the poor with us, and surely the poor will be blessed with a year's wages. That's like, I don't know what the average wage in New Zealand is. I'm going to say £30,000, $40,000, something like that. That, that, that. That's what this is. So you could do quite a lot of good with that, and we might be offended. It's a waste, isn't it? But it's a beautiful waste. And isn't that what worship is? It's a waste. But it's a beautiful waste. And isn't that what Jesus did? He smashed his jar and gave his life. It's a waste. But it's a beautiful waste. Jesus is not just useful. He's beautiful. And this is a love thing. This is a love thing. It's a gift. Gift is interesting, isn't it? You go to someone's house and I haven't actually done this for, for Fraser and Sarah, but you go to someone's house and you bring them a gift. So sorry. It's okay. I'll send you something. Uh, and they say, they always say it wasn't necessary, don't they? It's not necessary. And I want to say, of course it flipping wasn't necessary as a gift. If it was necessary, it'd be a payment. <laughs> yes, I know. Actually, charge new wine. <laughs> yeah. it's it's a waste 
It's a waste. It's everything. Worship is not the thing that helps us do the thing. It's the thing. Jesus is not the thing that helps us do the thing. He's the thing. Doing things for, things for Jesus is not the deal. Worshipping Jesus is the deal. I mean, the Jesus who is in you flow out of you. And so, how do you walk with Jesus? I, th- I think this is one of the most pertinent questions for the generation that we're raising up and for our generation. How do you walk with Jesus? What does that look like? Um, I, I was, uh, maybe this is just me, but I was given one way of walking with Jesus. You read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. <laughs> you know, and you, there's an evangelical quiet time. You get up in the morning, you read your Bible, every day with Jesus, or daily bread, or something else, and you read it, and you read it in sequence, and you, you, you will grow. And that's fine. It's not, it's not, that's not wrong. But depending upon your personality, <laughs> depending upon how you're wired, that will work for so And depending upon your time of life. My wife had four children. She found it really difficult to do a quiet time when she's got a dysfunctional husband who's working all the hours and she's looking after four children under the age of five. So she survived on, did any of you ever have those blocks of verses, Keswick blocks? There you go. Nikki survived on one verse a day. <laughs> so that, just, just that, that's all I've got time to do, but I've got that in, in my, so how do you, how do you walk with Jesus? Let me try something. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter one and two, there are four distinctives of the early church. Uh, which I think help us in, in working out how to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. Stay with me and humor me. If it's really weird, it's because I've got jet lag. If it's brilliant, it's because I'm brilliant. Um, <laughs> you know, it's because I inherited it from somebody else. Um, they devoted themselves is the first word. The word, the Greek word is the word proskiterio. And it, it means devotion to God and to one another. Um, they devote, they lived lives that were devoted. Um, second word is the word fellowship. The word is koinonia, and uh, it means to have things in common. So in other words, it was the open-handed, we, we share everything, we own nothing. So it's the word for community. The third word is the word found in Acts chapter 1, where it says, wait in Jerusalem, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses. The word is witness, the word is martyr, and it means to witness to. It's uh, it's the word for mission. You give your life for something. And the fourth word is the word dynamos or dynamos. It's the word for power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Four words. And I want to use those four words as four impulses um, for living a life with Jesus. Devotion, community, witness, power. And I'm going to draw it like this. Devotion, community, witness, power. Because that's the driving force behind these things. Proskiterio, koinonia, martyr, dinamos. Acts chapter 1 and 2. My Celtic forefathers uh, had a concept that they called the thin place. You heard of this? So in other words, they would say that there were places on the earth, in Scotland or Ireland, because that was the, their understanding of the earth, where the veil between heaven and earth had been worn thin by the revelations of God and the prayers of the saints. So in other words, Iona was a thin place. 
Lindisfarne was a thin place. Some of the monasteries were thin places. Some of the mountains were thin places. Some of the caves where the Celtic saints had prayed were thin places. And people would make uh, journeys to, pilgrimages to these thin places because they were places where heaven touches earth. Probably if they were around today, they would say Bethel is a thin place. You know, places where if you go there, you encounter God. Other traditions would say Lourdes is a thin place, uh, depending upon your your tradition. The, the reality is those those things are true, but not not deep truth. The deep truth is this: I'm a thin place. You're a thin place. We're all thin places because we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We're places where heaven and earth it's thin. It collides in, in, in this place. And these thin places are just provocations for us of the thin place that is within. Does that make sense? So when we're in the place, it's just a provocation of the fact that the thin place is, 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 is within us. And so I want to use, and we have been using for a while, some of those places as provocations to a walk with Jesus. So try this with me. We we talk about the cave, the table, the road, and the fire. The cave is the devotional space. The table is the community space. The road is the missional space. And the fire is the power space. So in other words, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you need cave time. You need time when it's just Jesus and you, you and Jesus. Not anybody else, just you. God, what are you saying to me today? What am I supposed to do with what you're saying to me today? It's devotional space. So for us, uh, our day starts with the cave. We read the Bible. We ask the Holy Spirit to come. We start our day with God before any other noise in, in our lives. The road is the missional space. It's the risk space. It's the God I'm making space for you to show up and do something in my life space. It's the, it's the interruption of my daily day space. So we would stop at 12 o'clock, our alarms are set, we pray the Lord's Prayer and we interrupt our day and remind us of the fact that this is about Jesus. And we say, God, would you send us to the people we're supposed to speak to and be amongst? The table is the fellowship space or the community space. It's the, God, who would you bring around my life space? It's where you eat together. Do you know, if, if you showed up in Auckland and you had just become a Christian and you didn't know anything about church and you'd never been to a church before and you had no history of church and you weren't put off church and you just had this book, what would you come up with? Well, you'd You'd come up with feasting, wouldn't you? You'd probably do a lot of eating together. There's a lot of that in here. Jesus talks about it a lot. People do it a lot. They share food a lot. There's something very sacred about that. And so the table is a space where you say, God, who are the people you bring into my life that you would bring into my life? And how do they interact with me? And how do they help me? And how do we pray together? And how do we serve together? It's the table space. And the fire is the evening space. It's the examine space. It's the before I lay my head on the pillow space. It's the God, what do I need to leave behind in today space? What do I need forgiveness for space? What do I need to forgive Space. What did you teach me today? Space. What needs to come into my tomorrow? Space. It's the sanctification 
space. So the cave devotion, the road interruption, the table community, and the fire sanctification. And so if this is helpful or useful, it's helpful because I'm not saying you have to spend an hour in the Word or you need to pray these particular prayers or here's a liturgy that you have to say. But I'm saying if these impulses are in your life, you will grow. If these impulses are in your life, you will reach people. If these impulses are in your life, you will do community. If these impulses in your, are in your life, you will know Jesus and follow Jesus. The cave, the table, the road, and the fire. And here we come full circle. Make space. Make space for what I'm going to do. The, pr- the prime job you have as a leader is to make space for God to do what he wants to do among you and among people that God has called you to lead. Let me pray for us. So God, we pray um, a wheat and chaff prayer. We pray that which was of you and wheat that which is supposed to produce a harvest would grow in us, bug us, flourish in us, and become our lives. And that which is was nonsense and of the preacher and very fleshy, <laughs> would you blow it away on the wind like chaff, that it wouldn't affect us in any way, shape or form. Holy Spirit, we invite you to sift this and to sift us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name.